My name is Michelle Bachman. I'm a member of the United States Congress, and I have to tell you, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to be here with all of you here this afternoon at the Oxford Union. Thank you for the invitation, Polina. Thank you all for coming. And uh, to be here in a room filled with some of the brightest minds in the world is absolutely humbling. Although I wondered what in the world was going on, the fact that it's your last day of term and you're still here. That kind of <laughs> amazed me that you'd be here, but I wish you all very well on your break and on your continued study. I'm extremely proud of you. By profession, I'm a federal tax litigation attorney. That's what my training was, that's what I did. We have an undergraduate degree, we have a graduate degree, and then I pursued a postgraduate, uh, postdoctoral degree in tax law. And as a tax attorney, I went to work prosecuting tax cheaters on behalf of the United States government. So just when I thought you couldn't have any lower approval rating in the world as someone who is collecting taxes for our government, I chose to run for the United States Congress. <laughs> and that's when I really learned what it was to have a low approval rating, or so I thought. Then I ran to become President of the United States. And clearly, uh, that allowed me to be despised by all. And so I can assure you, I came here today with no hubris, um, only with well-earned humility. So it's exciting for me to be able to be here. But as a member of Congress, I also believe that there's a certain kinship that I have with all of you here at the Oxford Union, because there's something very special that we do share, indeed. And it would be this. It is that we believe in the power of reason. We believe in the power of informed debate, as I've already seen in my interaction with some of you, because you believe quite clearly that the power to improve people's lives is what it's all about. It doesn't get any better than that. That's what I believe, and I believe that that's what you believe as well. And we do that by maintaining, by the maintenance of freedom. Because you see, I believe that here at Oxford, the culture of debate and cross-examination that you helped to develop, and in fact, this is the epicenter, this is the origin, origination of free speech at this university. It is one of the greatest gifts of the English-speaking people, and that's to be commended and something to be proud of. I often, to think of. I often think to myself, if we only had something like the Prime Minister's questions <laughs> in the United States of America with members of Congress. Maybe we too would have our chance at perfecting the British art of wit. I don't know, <laughs> but we could try. So this afternoon, I'd like to offer just a few thoughts on what I believe will help the d determine the future of any forward-leaning society, which clearly this is, and I hope the United States remains. And that is this concept. It is change through innovation. Now that doesn't seem radical, but it's necessary, and that's our very present reality. And I won't start with Washington, D.C., because that's not where it happens from my eight years of experience there. Instead, I'd like to start just with a story that my own grandmother told me in my home state of Minnesota, and it was this. She was born in 1903. She passed away at the age of 84 in 1987, just after our second son was born. And she was an absolutely delightful individual. She read the Wall Street Journal every day. She read Time Magazine every week. She worked in a factory her whole life. She'd never had an education. She was completely self-taught. One of the happiest people I ever met in my life. She could converse with anyone on any topic. And what she told me was this. She said at the end of her life, I have had the most extraordinary life anyone could imagine. I feel more blessed than anyone I know. When I was born, it was horse and buggy days. We had, the, we had the firelight. We didn't have anything more than a candle or an oil lamp. This was, this was in the state of Iowa in the, middle, in the Midwest. They hadn't had trains in the town where she lived. So she was more akin to two centuries before than to the granddaughter that she related the story to. She hadn't seen the onset of electricity. She hadn't seen the telegraph, the telephone. She, had, she then came to uh, understand what it was to have radio, TV, internet, all the rest. You know where I'm going with this. If you think about what it was that happened from 1903 until 1987 in the United States, it's more than extraordinary. But it was based upon the concept of innovation. And innovation, while it happens across the world, in particular, 
We saw it happen in ways never before imagined in the United States. And, it, and as we saw that, I want to tell you the story of another Minnesotan of whom you may never have heard, but who made a difference beyond anything that we can practically conjure up. And it would be this. He did something that saved the lives of a billion people. How many of us can say that? How many of us could do that? This is a little, what my mother would call, just a common old shoe. A guy from Minnesota called Norman Borlaug. Doesn't sound very consequential, but what he did was. And this was it. He had an idea and he acted on it. He went to our university, it's not Oxford, mind you, but it was the University of Minnesota. He attended the University of Minnesota and there he got his PhD. He got it in plant biology. He also went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970. I believe that this was a well-deserved Peace Prize, a well-deserved recipient. Because after World War II, after he'd gotten his PhD, he traveled to Mexico. And while he was in Mexico, he began working on how wheat could be grown. And here was his creative genius. In Mexico, he attempted two strikingly innovative projects. The first was this. He bred more than 6,000 experimental strains of wheat. It was a far more ambitious rate than any biologist had done before. He looked for traits to improve resistance to diseases. He made the stem sturdier, and as a result, Norman Borlaug developed a superior grain, and he was able to breed these diverse strengths into a single robust line. And through this process, what he managed to do was completely reconstruct a grain of wheat. The second spark, of his genius stemmed from Borlaug's creativity was to conduct his experiments at two environmentally disparate locations in Mexico, sites that shared virtually nothing in common. There were different altitudes, different temperatures, different soils, different rainfall, different sunlight. Then he moved these successful strains back and forth between the locations that were completely inhospitable to the other grain, between these two sites every season, and that hadn't been tried before. And after a few seasons, Borlaug had a strain of wheat that was able to succeed in both of the environments. And as a result, this strain was hardier, more resilient, and it was tougher than any variety of wheat that had ever been produced before in the history of mankind. You see, after 6,000 failures, Borlaug succeeded. And boy, did he succeed. The fruit of his creative genius was wheat, wheat likely to thrive almost anywhere in the world, even in places that wouldn't historically support it. Then he took his seeds to India and to Pakistan, where death and famine were all too often a common way of life. And in these countries, they yielded more wheat than the countries had ever seen before. And within a few years, wheat production doubled, just like that. And from there, he applied his innovative thinking and experimentation to improving rice yields in East Asia, and he saved more people there. Today, Norman Borlaug is credited with saving the lives, as I said, of literally over a billion people around the world. Who can say that? Not me. And I love Borlaug's story because it tells us why human creativity has to be nurtured and defended and allowed to thrive if our lives should improve. Who could be against it? But there are those who are, usually in the form of bureaucracies. You see, it's my thesis that it's no coincidence that the greatest explosion of innovation in history has accompanied our very first experiments with political liberty, something you know all too well here in Oxford and free enterprise, because it's only because of freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of association, scientific freedom, and certainly economic freedom that allows us the experimentation, pluralism, debate, and the chance for, for people, common old shoes like Norman Borlaug, to start and fail and start and fail and multiply that by 6,000 and finally succeed. It's the use, as economist Friedrich Hayek, one of my favorites, said, of the particular knowledge of time and place that innovation demands. How fortunate it is for a billion people today and their children that Norman Borlaug had the freedom to innovate and try those ideas that he didn't have to go to some bureaucracy to ask for permission 6,000 different times to test that particular grain of wheat, that when he saw an opportunity no one else saw, 
but him, that the experts couldn't dictate to him where he could or couldn't plant his seeds, that they didn't take up the space that he needed for innovation. So as we're standing here today, the European Union is contemplating making it illegal to grow or trade any plant <coughs> seed that the EU hasn't already approved and that already isn't admitted into its registry. It wants to charge an annual fee for every single registry. Imagine doing that 6,000 times and, and also imagine the paperwork that went along with it. The proposed regulation would essentially give the EU even more control over plant genetics than they have today. But I come today to praise Caesar, so to speak, not to, not to bury him, because in today's Guardian newspaper when I woke up, I saw that your Prime Minister's science advisors made, issued a report today, and it was to scrap the dysfunctional EU regulations that risk curtailing future food supplies. I want to quote from uh, the, his, uh, David Cameron's science advisor, Sir Mark Walport. We take it for granted that because our supermarket shelves are groaning with food, there are no problems with the food supply. But there are, said Great Britain's chief scientific advisor. If we, if, if we don't continue to innovate, the risk is that people will go unfed. We need to take back the powers from Brussels to unilaterally approve. In the last year, only two crops were approved by the EU, while in the United States, 96 were approved. There are consequences to putting the, the, the governor, so to speak, on innovation. Norman Borlaug himself saw these bureaucratic threats to what it would be like to a guy like him in the future. And this is his quote 40 years ago. He said, one of the greatest threats to mankind today is that the world may be choked by an explosively pervading but well camoufla camouflaged bureaucracy. How prophetic he was. And I commend your government of Great Britain today for acting on that warning. Because you see, the urge to control progress is pervasive. I see it every day in the United States of America. And that's exactly what stifles human creativity and innovation. It freezes the dynamic process of trial and error. It privileges the status quo over the new. It privileges the few over the many, the rich over the poor, and the big over the small. That isn't rhetoric. It's reality. And it has consequences for all of our lives. And it isn't just government. There's no shortage of bureaucracy in the, in the big private companies as well. I see that in the United States too. They want their counterparts, people like me in big government, to fix the regulatory environment just for them so they would be privileged to advance their own particular business interests or protect themselves artificially against competition. Because you see, cronyism hurts innovation too. In fact, I think our history is filled with stories of the human impulse to control innovation. In fact, you can look no further the invention of the printing press. That threatened the scribes. The scribes were the gatekeepers of knowledge. They slandered the printing press with all sorts of sins, and they urged the princes to restrict it. Then the printing presses, the newspapers, they hated the invention of the radio. As a matter of fact, they put pressure on to make sure that it was illegal to broadcast news over the airwaves until after the printed newspaper reached the streets. And more recently, in my own country, the paper industry felt so threatened by the digital age that they created a group called Consumers for Paper Choice. They're trying to lobby people like me in Washington so that I will slow the transition away from paper in our government into the digital age. After all, I need to preserve your right to hand fill out paperwork for every government. <laughs> so here's another example. And you probably see this one here, although I think you're unique in your system. There's a, many supporters of one size fits all education. Surely they're in the United States. I imagine there's a few here as well. In fact, they're threatened by new and exciting ways of learning. We should never be threatened by learning. I'm a mother to five biological children, all grown and gone. Two left in college, thank God, and then we're done. <laughs> also, 23 foster children that we took into our home. So you are looking at a mother of 28. I am the old woman in the shoe, right here in front of you. I helped start the first K-12 charter school in the United States of America because I saw with my children, no two were alike. They were all completely unique. One is a medical doctor at the top of this field. We have others 
who needed uh, helps in order to be able to learn. You see, they had different ways of learning. But try telling that to the California Bureau of Private Post-Secondary Education. They're in the process of trying to levy fines and shut down companies that are trying to uh, teach learn to code. That's uh, learning to write computer code boot camps unless these boot camps comply with California's requirements on how to learn. Now what's bizarre about all of this is that most of the, most of the graduates of these companies get jobs at Google and Adobe. So I think they figured it out. But only a bureaucracy would think they know more than what Go about what Google needs than what Google thinks they need. I also come from a state in Minnesota where we had another genius. His name was Earl Bakken. And in 1957, he was puttering around in his garage right by my house in Maplewood, Minnesota. And what he did with some duct tape was amazing. He invented the heart pacemaker. Today, that heart pacemaker turned into what's known as Med Medtronic Corporation, one of the leading and greatest, in our opinion, medical device manufacturing companies in the world. We have, the, we have devices doing incredible things to extend people's lives. But the health capabilities that we have today, I think, are going to be nothing like what we're going to see in the future. All of the, all of the advances that my grandmother witnessed, everything to putting a man on the moon to the internet and all the rest, all of that I think pales in comparison to the innovations that I think you are going to see in your lifetime. Now think of that. Here's the context. She went from horse and buggy, no electricity, to the internet age, and my opinion is you'll see greater. Think of that. Only if we keep safe this valuable concept called innovation. And in our lifetime, there'll be devices that will monitor our vital signs and our metrics, health metrics, 24 hours a day. In fact, this is how close it could be. Or it could be the little device that you wear on your wrist to make sure that you're eating right and exercising. All of these important advances are coming. Because your smart smartphone could be able to crunch through your data, your individual data, and actually diagnose you. Perhaps warn you when you get to be my age of an impending heart attack, or get you a prescription for an antibiotic when you have an infection. Imagine if there is a diabetic in the room, and I imagine that there is with this sampling, that you have to prick your finger how many times a day to draw blood, multiple times. Diabetics could wear a contact lens that monitors your glucose levels and your tears. That's already here in development. Researchers believe now that they will be able to develop 3D printing to perhaps print out a replacement kidney if you need a kidney. No more dialysis, no more donor, donor waiting lists. And I can imagine the, the waiting line would be a mile long for brains from Oxford if we're <laughs> gonna do any 3D printing. I can guarantee there will be no wait at the doors of the United <clears throat> States Congress. The, pen, the, ten, the potential, however, for regenerative medicine and genetics to cure diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's is beyond the charts. That's our future. And again, I come here to praise Great Britain and what you're doing, not to bury you. Because in the Guardian newspaper, again today, there was an article, uh, and it is, it is also, I, I wanna make reference to a new book by Peter Huber. If you get a chance to read it on your break, it's called The Cure is in the Code. Because doctors can use a breast cancer patient's genetic data, her personal data, to devise a drug regimen just for her that therapy, that therapy is, a lot more, is a lot less miss and a lot more hit. You see, that's where we are today. Because I think the days of using penicillin as one drug to cure everyone are, is over. We're now looking at designer boutique drugs that are based upon your genome. That's where we're at. We can go in and look at you and your situation and in your code tells the researcher and tells the doctor what your maladies are and what it is that would specifically cure you and get you to full health. You're completely different. Your, your chemistry is completely diverse to the person sitting next to you. That's the day and age that we live in and it's extremely exciting. But that doesn't work in, the, in our United States FDA. Our great bureaucracy 
requires two approval tracks, one for medical devices, one for biologics, and it's, it's extremely difficult. It takes 10 to 15 years in America just to prove a typical drug at a cost of more than a billion dollars. You have that problem here in the United Kingdom as well. And that's caused your research and develop industry to take flight and move. You see, that's what innovation requires. You've got to continue to foster that environment so that new drugs that all of us need, the new devices all of us need, will have the ability to be able to develop. The FDA in our country hardly knows where to begin with regenerative medicine other than to say the, world, the word no. And that threatens health care, yours. And that threatens education and energy development, transportation, you name it. And that's why so many people in America right now worry about America in decline. This is new for Americans. We've been very optimistic. We always see that the next generation would be better for our children. And that's a different phase that we're in right now, something I hope to reverse. The more power that we give to the centralized bureaucracies, the more power the bureaucrats have to block the future, that keeps us in the past. But more importantly, it hurts the poor and the vulnerable more than any others. So what do we do about all that? Well, it's very simple. Simple rules, simple understandable rules that allow for innovation and constantly growing rather than throwing sand in the gears. So think about this device that I held up for you, this smartphone. Think about this. This is all you've known in your lifetime is to be able to have technology like this. This is new for old people like me. But in this device, you are able to contain your music, so what you say, your camera, so what you say, photos, your phone, the world's encyclopedia. Everything is in this one little device. I'm old enough to remember typing all my papers in college and law school, my postgraduate program. I typed them on real paper, paper. <laughs> and I walked over to my professor, I handed it to him. I didn't push the button, hit send, and he got it. It's a very different world. Today, I FaceTimed back at home with the kids. I Snapchatted with my staff at home. <laughs> That's what members of Congress do all day, by the way. We Snapchat. Um, we also get advanced degrees that way. I have a daughter-in-law doing that now with Georgetown, getting her a me advanced medical degree through <gasps> Skype. Isn't this a great world? To give perspective on what we take for granted. Did you know back in, oh, somebody's calling me right now. Back in 1991, it, just the tech, it would have cost you over two million pounds. If there's any Americans here, $3.6 million. It would cost you over two million pounds to put together the capability on your iPhone. That's just the processing power. That's just the network capabilities. That's just the memory. That doesn't even include the screen that breaks every time you drop the thing unless you've got a case on it. That doesn't include the screen. It doesn't include the camera, the software, the app store. You couldn't buy that at any price. Today I'm told here in the United Kingdom that the iPhone costs about 200 British pounds and when you buy, when you buy it from your cellular carrier. That would work out to a 99.99% reduction in the cost of a smartphone in two decades. Good work, Steve Jobs. <laughs> Good work. The next generation of Steve Jobs and Norman Borlaugs are sitting right here in this campus, and they're sitting in campuses all across the world, and I believe that you are ready to step up and create the next life-saving device that the world needs. You see, we need you. We need that creative genius. Because reports tell us that 77% of you want to be your own boss. Well, I don't believe that. I think 100% of you want to be your own boss. I rated, raised 28 of you. They all want to be their own boss. <laughs> but governments need to encourage, not discourage, independent thought. The environment of freedom is the most successful for, for independent creativity. It, freedom gives us the greatest leap ever in human well-being. It improves our lives by an order of magnitude. It represents the opportunity to thrive. It doesn't matter your age or your gender or your race. And the rece recipe for success is simple. You encourage work, you don't discourage it. Because innovation is a mindset and it comes through work, not government dependency. And here again, I come to praise Great Britain. Again, another story just came out about what you're doing 
that I believe is so very good. Remember again, I'm a federal tax lawyer. This comes out of your British newspaper, The Telegraph, and it said this. They just did a study of all of the industrialized nations and found that in the United States since 2000, more than any country in Europe, the United States is growing our welfare state with health care and pension programs, except for Ireland, Spain, and Portugal. Other than that, the United States is finding that we are moving in a trajectory that's unlike any we've ever known. But Great Britain is moving in a direction that, that is completely different than what they've done before. And you're showing remarkable signs of success. This is what you've done to innovate your welfare programs. You, what you've done is you have consolidated your major welfare programs into a single grant. We have 126 separate welfare programs in the United States. Over 73 are cash assistance programs. And this program in Great Britain has been wildly successful. In the first three months following the act, enactment, the British job force partition, pr participation increased by 280,000, almost 1%. We in the United States today, by contrast, are at the lowest level of job participation rate in modern times. Some say since we've recorded the rate of labor participation. We have over 50 million Americans of working age that aren't in the labor force. That's unique for us. We're changing course, just like you are also changing course. I think we need to expand freedom for people to not only follow their dreams, we don't want to stop people from benefiting from failure. The greatest lesson anyone can ever have. As a former federal tax lawyer, I know firsthand that our tax code can kill innovation. It's, it, it destroys people, I've seen it firsthand. And last year was our 100th anniversary of the adoption of the United States Income Tax Code. It's hardly something to celebrate, in my opinion, although it's given me a lot of employment over the years. In 1913, our top tax bracket was 7%. Our tax code was 400 pages long. 100 years later, the top tax bracket is 40% in the United States, far more than that if you add on your state and local taxes, and our tax code is 74,000 pages long. It doesn't include the regulations. When Margaret Thatcher's colleague, Ronald Reagan, came into office in 1980, the top U.S. tax rate was a stunning 70%. Now, you're not going to be a student much longer. Pretty soon, you're going to have a paycheck. Think of that, 70% taken right off the top. By the time Reagan left office, it was down to 28%. He also gave a 25% across-the-board reduction for everyone's income tax and simplified it for everyone as well. He not only cut taxes, he reduced spending, he reduced regulations, he maintained a strong United States dollar, and here was the result, if you ever thought ideas have consequences. We had 92 consecutive months of economic growth after Reagan's revolution. It was the longest peacetime expansion in America's history. The previous record had been 80, 58 months. Astounding. Margaret Thatcher said in her eulogy for Ronald Reagan, she said, we have something Ronald Reagan never had. We have his example. And as we saw from Reagan's example, what drove innovation and growth was an environment of freedom that fostered it. 30 years ago, this very same company introduced what was known as the personal computer, or the, the personal computer in a TV ad. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It aired only one time. It was in 1984 in a Super Bowl ad. Don't look at it now, but after you leave, put it on YouTube and pull it up because Forbes magazine called it the best advertisement that's ever been done of all time. So go to YouTube. The ad depicts a dystopian future like the one that George Orwell presented in 1984. Brainwashed masses are sitting in orderly rows, kind of like this, <laughs> eyes up, listening to the dictates of Big Brother, blaring forth on a large TV screen. Then from the back of a large hall, a woman came in with a sledgehammer. Some, some uh, sledgehammer, some henchmen were trying to stop her. She was running up to the screen, and just as she got to it, she took her sledgehammer, put it back, and threw it at the face of Big Brother. And what Apple was trying to say is that the personal computer had arrived and that life would never be the same again. And they were right. The computer, more broadly, was going to win the contest between the liberating forces of innovation 
and the stagnating forces of the will to control. It was prophetic. Steve Jobs, Apple, they changed the world. And that's just the beginning, which takes me back to Norman Borlaug and the billion people that he saved. He was a genius. He was very much like every single person that's in this room. He's like you. He was exceptionally smart. But there's an older sense of the word genius. The ancient spoke of genius is something that you had. It was divine inspiration, and I believe in it. As recently as the 19th century, people talked about finding your genius, that special gift to the world that is in each one of us. And it's in that sense, I think, that Norman Borlaug made his greatest contribution to humanity because he saved a billion people, and out of those billion people is the most precious resource we could have. It's human capital, people themselves. And one of those people was a man named Paul Raj from India. Paul Raj earned his engineering degree the year after Borlaug took wheat to his famished country. Paul Raj invented MIMA, a core technology of nearly all modern wireless communications, from Wi-Fi to cellular. His invention empowers billions of rural poor people to participate in the world economy for the first time in places where smartphones arrived before landlines. I saw it myself firsthand over our Thanksgiving late November in Haiti. Our daughter works in an orphanage. We went down to see her. It is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And yet while we were there, up in the mountains, there we saw people with cell phones, calling people in the mountains of Haiti where you can't drink the water and where you have to divert your, your uh, face from a shower spigot that only puts out cold water. You see, I believe that this, this people like Paul Raj are the future, as you do as well. And so the question becomes, how do we model our nation to help us make the best use of this genius? Will we limit this creativity or will we liberate it? We'll liberate it. How much progress our societies make will depend in large part on your work, on your genius at work, and that's why I believe we choose the path that unleashes freedom for human creativity. That path that gives us a role to play that will be so different from any that we've known before. Because the world needs what you're about to create. It's an endeavor, I think, that's worth thinking about, worth talking about, worth committing ourselves to, and yes, even worth defending from an overarching government or private company that wants to squelch the innovation that lies within you. That's the essence, and that's the cost, and that's the beauty of this marvelous gift that we steward called freedom. And so I thank you for the gift of allowing me to share it with you today. Thank you.